one. Uh, uh, again, Roman Schmulinson is our director, director of Kajeko, and uh, I'm really happy. Uh, first of all, I'm happy that all of you are here in our academy. And as I see, the geography is pretty quite wide. It's the whole North America, including Canada and the whole United States. So welcome. And I'm happy to introduce you our presenter today. Uh, it's uh, Jacob Yaakov Shoshan. Yaakov Shoshan is in Israel. It's also uh, almost morning there. And Yaakov, Tadaraba. Amonto Dot, thank you so much for your time uh, to be here and to present the topic about the uh, Jewish history of Morocco, Jewish Morocco. Uh, Jacob Shashan, Yaakov Shashan, born in Jerusalem. He is a licensed tour guide in Israel, as well as a teacher and lecturer for the Tour Guide College in Israel. He is also a senior tour, tour director and lecturer for the Geographical Society in Israel. Shoshan has visited 98 countries and led tours in 66 countries on all six continents. Jacob is fluent in many languages. He presents in-depth discussions on Jewish history, philosophy, and culture, and is deeply involved in Holocaust education. So, Yaakov, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. And I'd like to say hi to everybody. With your permission, I'll say, say special hi to some people I recognize. Hi, Betty and David. I had the pleasure of traveling with you before. And we'll take now the plane and cross the Atlantic Ocean on our way from North America to come to uh, Morocco. We'll uh, come to the northern part of Africa. Everybody knows where it is. Just a small reminder of the location. Morocco harbors both the Mediterranean and the Atlantic Ocean on the northwestern corner of the African continent. And we will go on a tour that will take us from Casablanca to Rabat on our way to Fez, subsequently to Marrakesh, and a little into the desert and into the Atlas Mountains. A few facts and figures. You can see the flag of Morocco. Look at the area. It's a rather large country with a very large population. And look at the number of the Jews that used to be there in 1948. Today, it says 2,500, but the truth is we could say a thousand or eight thousand, because very few people live there now year round. Many of the Jews who live there have the other main residence either in France or in Canada or mostly in Israel, but they go back and forth. But we can see that short 70 odd years ago, it was home to a very, very large Jewish population. Today, the descendants of the Moroccan Jews are the second largest ethnic group in Israel, if we can do it that way, because everybody's Jewish and everybody's Israeli, but Israelis of North African, mostly Moroccan descent, constitute the second largest uh, ethnic, if you call it, group in Israel, after Jews, of course, who came from the former Soviet Union. This is the route that we will take traveling after landing in Rabat, in uh, Casablanca, we'll go to Rabat, all the way up north to Chef Shawan, uh, Fez, uh, by way of Meknes, to Marrakesh. When people say Casablanca, I think that is one of the first images that comes to many people's mind, that beautiful movie, and if you haven't seen it in a while, maybe it's a good chance to visit it, especially because of the context of World War II and the story of the Holocaust, the way it was represented, even though most of it was filmed, of course, in the studios in Hollywood, but nevertheless, it's a very interesting topic to go and visit it again. The airport we land in is Mohammed V airport, named after this very special person to whom we have very special relations. He did whatever he could to protect the Jews, unfortunately, 
Uh, his time was the time when uh, France was uh, ruling in a certain way uh, Morocco, and the time when the Vichy government took over meant that it could be bad news for the Jews who lived there. And he tried very hard, he had actually to leave and he left, he went on exile uh, after he made these kind of statements. And he came back only later on when after the war, when uh, France left and Morocco became totally independent again. So everybody has very special feelings and warm, warm attitude and reflections on the time of the king. Here we have the king meeting with both US president and British prime minister. And this is the time when uh, we realized exactly what his stance was during that time. It was only a few days ago that many people in Israel, not only Jews of Moroccan descent, have celebrated a unique holiday celebrated by Moroccan Jews. It's called Mimuna. And that is celebrated during the last night, right after Pesach is over, and we can go back to eat uh, leaven or partly leaven bread. They mix the flour and they fry these very thin pancakes, which they soak in butter and honey. And that's part of a big tradition. Everybody goes to visit Moroccan uh, families, Jews, of course, of Moroccan descent. And it's a big chance for the politicians, of course, to come and show themselves around. It was a short while ago that we started having direct flights from Israel to Morocco and back, of course, and each uh, first flight was a first of a sort into creating yet another link with a Muslim country. So it was a very moving activity. You can imagine they were singing and dancing and big joyous festivities. And when you visit uh, Casablanca, obviously you'd like to discover the Jewish heritage. You hardly, hardly find a minion in most, for those of you who are not familiar with the word, in order for the Jews to be able to pray in public. Jews can pray anywhere by themselves, but if they pray in public, they should have 10 people to pray together with. So you hardly find this kind of gathering in most of the synagogues there, hardly ever, unless there is a group visiting or some special event, some gathering, some convention, and then you'll find them. But we still have the many different synagogues. Most of them are kept in a very, very nice condition. And a few years ago, a museum opened up showing the story of Moroccan Jewry. King Mohammed V was followed by his son, King Hassan II. And Hassan II played a very important role brokering the first peace negotiations between Israel and many different countries, not only with the Palestinians, but especially with Egypt. It was here in Morocco that King Hassan offered his sponsorship, his hospitality, everything in a clandestine manner, top secret, where Israelis met with different Arab dignitaries. And it was the meeting that he offered that led to the peace with Egypt. The first initial uh, meetings took place in Morocco. King Hassan II, honoring the memory of his father, which for us, of course, as I mentioned, is a very special story, built one of the largest structures, not only in the country, but in the Muslim world, the mosque dedicated to his father. And that's a place we'd like to visit now. It's a magnificent building featuring not just traditional Muslim architecture, but a unique Moroccan one at that, for example, look at the minaret, unlike most minarets in the Muslim world, which are round column-like structures, this one is built in a square shape and that's very typical of Moroccan architecture, Moroccan Muslim architecture. Of course, the details inside would remind you of sort of some things that you have seen in Spain and other places where Islam has left their marks and it was really from here that this architecture arrived if you visited Alhambra or Mesquita or other places 
in Granada, in Cordova, in Sevilla, in other locations in Spain. It came from North Africa, and that's where we can remind ourselves of these beautiful structures, very, very uh, nicely done with uh, good taste to many people. It's large, it can contain thousands of people, and we love to see the perspective from the beautiful copper and brass light fixtures to this gorgeous, gorgeous hall, which are very special. So that's Mohammed V Mosque. Other than that, Casablanca is a very, very modern city. It's the center and the business hub of the country. It's not the capital. There are four royal capitals. The main one, the official political one will go next. That will be Rabat, but Casablanca is where lots of the stuff happens. This is where the headquarters of the banks, the financial corporations, and so on. They're all located in this city, which is a very interesting combination of African landscape, European, Middle Eastern, with very, very modern architecture. Look at that. Also that we have in Casablanca, you walk a few steps away and you go into a traditional souk, the bazaar, offering lots and lots of handicrafts and traditional Moroccan outfit especially this babouche, this kind of slippers, this kind of uh, pantouflach, those of you who are familiar with this word, and uh, most people uh, at home would definitely do it, and some people will also walk in the street using this kind of traditional outfit against the backdrop of this city. In many of the Moroccan towns, there was a Jewish quarter. Actually, in most of them, there were two Jewish quarters. There was the Melah. Melah is a traditional site where the older part of the city is surrounded with the wall. Uh, and that was home to most of the people originally. And then when some people uh, did a little better in life, they moved to what they called the Medina. Medina in Arabic is a town. Like in Hebrew, it's a state, but in Arabic, it's a town. So they moved to the new section of town. So when you ask a, a Jew who originated from Morocco, uh, where did your family come from? So it's either from the Melah or from Medina. And this is the old Melah, the old Jewish neighborhood of Casablanca. We move on, we take the short ride, just a little over 50 miles connecting Casablanca to the royal capital of Rabat, which is the official capital of uh, Morocco, diplomatic capital in that sense, because we'll find out they have three more capitals, royal cities. This is another beautiful old town on the shores of the Mediterranean. The uh, old town is surrounded by a wall, and you see these whitewashed houses, uh, and the scenes are beautiful from many different locations. You see the old walls, you go through the gates, and you end up visiting the old town itself inside. Whereas the roofs and many of the top part of the houses are painted in white, we're going to discover unique hues and shades of the blue color, and that's how traditionally people like to decorate their houses, the doors, the walls, always the lower part blue and the upper one will be mostly white. Not always, but mostly white. And as we walk around, we see the people, lots of them still today, like to wear the traditional outfits. And as we walk through the old town, we come to the Melah. And that was, again, the Jewish quarter. Look at the name of the street. No more Jews really there, very few, as I mentioned, if any but David Cohen Street, the, the signs are mostly in Arabic and French because the French were there for the longest. This is the very interesting uh, train station offering very unusual architecture. And this is the Royal Palace. The King of Morocco has palaces all over the country. They are very ornate, very beautiful and offer a very interesting chance to have a glimpse at this royal architecture. You can see the guards who come from different branches of uh, the military forces and the security administration. And we love admiring these beautiful ceramic tiles. 
we move on to another location, another royal structure, that's a royal mausoleum. And here it's not just the guards, look at them. They are mounted on the backs of the horses guarding the entrance to the mausoleum. The mausoleum was built by Hassan II in honor of his father, Muhammad V, and now he is also buried there. So it's an, again a very, very interesting and a place we like to come and pay respect at the tomb of these two special monarchs, Muhammad V and Hassan II. I love the stained glass windows of the ceiling. The roof above the mausoleum is very ornate and very, very special. Also here, we'd like to go and pay a visit to the synagogue. As I mentioned, there were quite a few of them. Not all of them are um, open to services because there are, again, there are not enough people, but we can still pay a visit and look at them. When you travel in Morocco, and I hope you will, I know that some of you did, uh, you will be staying at some fabulous properties, but many of the modern hotels is what you would call cookie cutter. You wake up in a very nice uh, Sofitel or Four Seasons Hotel, and which is very interesting, but you could be anywhere in the world for that purpose. But Morocco offers a very unique kind of hospitality. This is called a Riyadh. If possible, try to stay at least in one of the places you go there because they took these stately homes, they took these beautiful uh, wealthy people mansions, if you wish, and converted them into very, very lavish, very nice hotels featuring the traditional architecture, the traditional furniture with the gardens, with the patios, and look at the rooms that are appointed in a very different way. As we know, we like blue by now, so we'll go to the blue town. We take the trip up the mountains on our way up north, and we come to the town of Shefshawen. And Shefshawen is really a city in blue. Wherever you look, there is such a beautiful presence of the blue color, and it makes the city very, very interesting and very pleasant to walk. It's very clean, very neat, and look at the special atmosphere you get when you walk up and down the narrow lanes of this town. And also here, you could stay at one of the nice Riyadhs. And the Jewish neighborhood, you see the sign written both in uh, Arabic, in the Spanish language, because now we go to a part of uh, Morocco that was held by uh, Spain for the longest time, and of course English. The Jewish neighborhood you see dates back to the 16th century when the Jews were welcome to reside within the walls of the Medina. Remember, moving from the Melah to the Medina, and that is unfortunately the only real memory we can look at from what used to be a thriving, prosperous Jewish community in Shefshawen. Another nice Riyadh, which I like. And now we move and we start going south inside the country. We'll travel on our way to Meknes, a little over 120 miles to come to yet another royal capital. But now we left the very green lush area and we are on the edge of the desert. And we come to this town of Meknes with the very busy marketplace which today is outside the city wall. The walls surround a very large area. It was a major stronghold uh, protecting the cities, especially the capital cities from nomadic tribes throughout the centuries. And I again admire these beautiful gates that lead us into the old town, especially the tile work. They have very interesting tile work beautiful ceramic tiles surrounding the different structures in different shapes and different style. Inside, one of the important places to visit would be the royal stables, which were home to hundreds of horses when, as I said, this was kind of a garrison town. And obviously, we'd like to take a walk through the colorful bazaar. We like to do it all over Morocco. It's always so ornate, so inviting, and so colorful. Very interesting to see the arts and crafts, lots of the woven fabric, lots of leather, and so on, 
and of course, a royal palace because it is a royal capital. We visit another synagogue here. This is the Bethel Synagogue in uh, Meknes. And there used to be not just synagogues, they had Jewish schools. Those of you who can read Hebrew can see Bet Sefer Ivri, Talmud Torah Meknes. So it's a Hebrew school, Talmud Torah in the town of Meknes and a very interesting Jewish cemetery with uh, ancient tombstones from time before they started marking them individually. It's only later that they started marking them. They just buried the people, put some kind of a stone on top or even built something out of bricks covered with plaster, but the people of the family knew it. Comes 19th and 20th century, they erected more modern uh, tombstones with names indicating who the person who is buried there. One of the nice things to do in this town is to take a ride in what they call the Kalesh, these chariots, this horse drone carriage. And we also here like to visit another very interesting mausoleum of Mulai Ismail, one of the local governors who was also a spiritual personality and the mausoleum is done in a very, very special way. Uh, quite interesting to visit and look at it. And here also we have the Riyads, if somebody cares to stay here. The afternoon time, especially before sunset, is a great hour to walk through the marketplace and around the marketplace. That's where we look at these beautiful Riyads. I really hope to give you an appetite to visit this country and then you do as I mentioned, try to visit at least one of these Riyads. We continue traveling from Meknes to one of the most exciting of them all, which is the town of Fez. We are heading into the mountain area, still not far from the desert, and we come to a huge, huge fortification which is on the mountain. We first get a beautiful view of the city from the outside of the old city wall. We look at the city and then we will travel by way of the Royal Palace, of course, and look at the beautiful doors uh, with the copper and brass, beautifully polished uh, doors leading into the Royal Palace before we venture into the town itself. Look again here, we see the minaret, uh, which is a square shape rather than the round one, as I mentioned in other locations. Going into the old town, we go through one of the many, many gates into an amazing maze. Thousands of stores in hundreds of narrow streets and lanes. And that is one of the places you easily get lost. If you don't know what you're doing, you don't go with the local who knows where to take you. My goodness. From one little lane to another, and you, as you see, you share the street not only with other people, but with animals, with horses and mules and donkeys, and very, very busy activity. And again, the people who are dressed in their traditional outfit. Fez is a major, major industry of leather. They work the leather here to create from handbags to clothes to coats to all kinds of uh, items these uh, poofs, as they call them, which you like to recline over. And they weave in the area, they weave lots and lots of carpets. So it's not an expensive like Persian carpet. Usually they're made of wool, a very little of cotton, but they offer the typical design and patterns of the countryside. So I love walking in the streets of the marketplace I love to see these beaten copper uh, items and most of it is made by hand traditionally. One of the highlights of visiting it, even though it's a bit unpleasant from the other point of view, is the tannery. For centuries, for centuries, this is where they have been processing the leather and dyeing the leather, putting it into colors. Unfortunately, this emits a scent, a smell which is not very pleasant, but for the couple minutes we go on the roof of one of the buildings to look at it, it's absolutely exciting. 
to see the people working exactly as they did centuries ago. Of course, today there is a beautiful modern leather industry in so many places around the world, but here they insist on doing it the traditional way, how to process the leather and then wash it and dry it and dye it. And it is a very fascinating visit to see the tanneries of Fez. And then you walk around and you look at some of the stately homes that were made into some beautiful shops, a beautiful madrasas. Madrasa is a Muslim uh, theological seminar, if you want. And in one of the narrow lanes that we walk, we discover a very amazing sign. This is the traditional site of the house of Maimonides. You know, Maimonides was born in Cordova in Spain. But during his time, the country was invaded by very radical tribes who came from uh, North Africa and they insisted that everybody should be a Muslim or chop goes your head. So his family left the Arabic says like it is uh, written down below, Moiz Maimonides, and here the in Arabic says Musa bin Maimon, which is the way very similar to how we pronounce it in Hebrew. So he lived here and he studied here, not only Judaics, but also medicine before he moved on to Cairo, where he settled for the rest of his life, where he was practiced medicine. He was the personal physician of the Sultan of Saladin, imagine. And at the same time, he composed these 14 amazing books offering us some of the greatest insight into Jewish studies. Uh, in the many restaurants, uh, people come not only for the food, but for all kinds of performances from the belly dancers to all kinds of folklore. But we'd like to go and visit a very interesting synagogue, a very ancient synagogue you can see constructed in the 17th century, still functions, uh, if not with locals, as I, as I mentioned, with local vi with visitors who visit, groups and individuals who come from all over, and we look around and we see the very humble, very simple structure, and can remind ourselves of the beautiful past of the congregation, in recent years, some people who left the country but originally were from this place uh, have donated and raised funds to fix and decorate and maintain the many different synagogues which are still around. A special visit here is to the Jewish cemetery. Again, these traditional tombstones with no names on them, later on names were added, especially at the site of the tombs of some special sages, some rabbis and their families, their spouses and so on. But everybody goes to pay a special visit at the tomb of a very special young girl. This is Sulika Hachuel. She was a young girl. They said that she was very, very beautiful and the son of the local Muslim ruler wanted to marry her. What could she do? He's going to take her, but he insisted that she should convert to Islam. And she said, no way. And he said, I will execute you. She says, go ahead. Even the local authorities and clergy people came and said, okay, just convert. It's okay. Survive. And she said, no, I will not relinquish my Jewish faith. And she was executed at 17 and her tomb became a place where they visit. It's a very big thing in North Africa. They call it Ziara. You go to pay a visit at the tomb of sages, scholars, Muslim, Jewish, and this young girl, Sulika, Lala Sulika. And mostly she is visited by non-Jews. The local Muslim population came, oh, she is like a saint. She is such a special lady and her tomb is a major pilgrimage site to Jews and non-Jews alike. Uh, there were books written about her, uh, an opera was written and uh, performed in honor of Sulika. We are not sure that's what she looked like, but that's a suggestion done by a 19th century artist. Again, here we look at some of these beautiful, beautiful riads 
And even if you don't stay there, just try to wander in, sit down for a cup of coffee or a cup of tea with some local uh, sweets or dessert or something, because it is a very special visit. I admire this unique architecture of these buildings and many of the patios are filled with plants and flowers, so it's quite interesting. We begin our journey now south on our way to maybe the most famous of them all, which is Marrakesh. On the way, we are traveling through the mountains. We have the Atlas and the anti-Atlas mountains. And at one point we go way up on top of the mountains and we come to Ifran and that does not remind us of Africa or any Muslim architecture. We could be in a very European, other than the desert around us, the architecture is European and it's true. This town was built by the French when they were there. And in the 1920s and on, it served as a major uh, ski holiday hub. They have beautiful slopes and people come to spend the ski holiday in this town and the surrounding are covered as you see by heavy snow. So it's a very interesting visit. Here you drive in the desert and you travel for an hour and you go up the mountain and you come to Ifran. By the way, Ifran was the place where the first meetings took place between the Israelis and the Egyptian delegates that led to the visit a very short while later, the visit of President Sadat in Jerusalem in 1977. This is a very interesting and typical village, Kenifra, uh, on the both banks of a small ravine, a small brook that goes here. So remember, we are in the desert and we are gonna stay in the desert for the rest of the stay here of our tour today. But again, I'd like to show the beautiful artwork which is done. It's very simple. It's not very sophisticated, but very typical of the carpet weaving industry. And here we are in Marrakesh, uh, dominated by the Kutubia, this very large monument, a brother to the one we have seen in Rabat. And also here, we enter the old town through some of the gates. Also here, we have the Royal Palace surrounded by a wall with gorgeous gates that are protected here. Look at how many different kinds of uniforms from the police to the military to the Royal Guard protecting the entrance to the King's Palace and the whole place is beautifully illuminated at night. And this is a place where you can actually travel inside and see the inner part of the palace, not going into the residential area, but at least you get an idea of the beautiful lavish uh, landscaping which they do in the Royal Palace. And here we visit the Kutubia, a typical major site dominating the city. And here we come to one of the most exciting parts of the city. This is Jama El Fena. Jama El Fena, that is the main marketplace. During the time of the day, it's very hot. Day hours are quite hot. Uh, during, um, of course, the summer, but even in the winter time, it's rather warm, but comes the night, it becomes very, very busy with lots of activity from vendors to people who make a living telling stories, people who volunteer to clean your ears, excuse me, and people who are the dentists who work the drill turning a pedal, like in a sewing machine. And that's how they drill through people's teeth. But you don't have to go to the dentist, just enjoy some fresh fruit uh, drink and some of the uh, snake charmers, plenty of the snake charmers in the square. And look, this guy offers dentures. He will fix dentures for you. He will use dentures from other people, won't tell what happened to the other people, but he will put the dentures for you so it's quite interesting to see them. And then of course, people play games, how to fish a battle with these rods and the ladies who are the fortune tellers who will also make some nice henna design on your palm, on your hands. And it is so interesting. They do it especially before weddings, but if you are visiting, you do it and it will stay on your hands for a couple of days before it will wash away. 
And look, some people opt to do it not only on their hands, but on their feet as well. So it's a very nice pastime. Going inside the bazaar, not in the square, again, we discover the arts and crafts, the handicrafts, the woven fabrics and the carpets and beautiful ceramics, especially the ceramics which they use in the kitchen. We see the tajins on the bottom right. We'll see them again. We see the herbs and spices and the dry fruits, the infusion they do from rose petals and all kinds of uh, plants which they soak and they infuse to create uh, their tea and beverages and a very nice industry of small glass vials for their perfumes. I love these light fixtures uh, which they produce and especially the ones made out of the brass. Again, we see their local shoes, some local soap industry and woven straw, beautiful baskets and bags and nice interesting jewelry inspired by the Berbers, by the desert dwellers, the nomadic tribes of the desert and the plates. By the way, at home, they love to use this kind of handmade, hand painted plates. And if you happen to visit the house, don't be surprised food will be served on this kind of plates. Beautiful metal work and of course the culinary scene. And this is the tajin. Very, very typical dish where they lay out the food in these clay pots and they cover them with this hood. These are people who are still traditionally wearing the clothes of the water carriers. Before they had running water, water was supplied. Remember when in the desert, you have to go to the well, to the spring, fetch water and bring it. So people had special clothes which you could recognize either to carry water for you at home or to offer you a little water to drink from these uh, uh, cups, metal cups, which they carried with them. Another place to take a nice carriage ride is through the lanes and streets of this beautiful town of Marrakesh. And here we come, of course, into the Jewish quarter and we'd like to visit the synagogue. All of the synagogues we visit, they still have Torah scrolls in them, which means officially they're functioning. They make sure to have the eternal light, the Ner Tamid burning in all of these synagogues. And uh, again, we sit around and hear the stories of the local community. And as we know, it was, as we say, just short few decades ago, very busy, bustling Jewish community. And you could easily see me like my colleague here talking to a group of visitors, sharing the stories from the local communities. I mentioned the local tribes. Other than the people who live in the city, we have quite a few ethnic minorities in Morocco. And when we go out for dinner or for a show, we like to listen to the local music. The musicians are wearing the traditional outfits playing some of the traditional instruments. And look at these ladies who come from the countryside during some of the events, the processions. And it's very, very colorful, very interesting to see the ladies with this colorful stuff. The men, however, were mostly white and blue. And these are the cross between the Berbers and the Tuareg the different nomadic tribes who occupied the high Atlas mountains, whereas the ladies, as you see, with very colorful outfit, the men are usually mostly with the special blue. This blue is so unique and so special. It has inspired many of the Europeans who came here and among them many uh, fashion designers who fell in love with this special color. This color was used traditionally for generations by the Tuareg people in their houses, in their shops, in their restaurants. And here we have this uh, amazing French painter, Jacques Majorel, who spent a long time painting uh, the people of Morocco in the cities, but especially in the countryside and in the mountains, in the encampments, in their tents. And he was inspired so much by them that he moved 
and built a beautiful house surrounded by a gorgeous garden where he imitated this unique shade of blue to the point that if you ask today professionally, this is called Majorel Blue. And I, of course, personally am fascinated by this uh, shape of uh, this shade of blue. And the house and the gardens have lots of pavilions and structures. Later on, he sold this house to a person you know very well. That was Yves Saint Laurent, the French designer. And Yves Saint Laurent and his partner lived here. And later on, uh, his partner passed away just a couple of years ago. And both of them are buried in the garden of their house. Across the street, they built a new museum, a modern building, but featuring uh, the way that they collected items from here, from all over the world, but the way they were inspired. Sometimes you look at his fashion, you say, oh, how interesting, Yves Saint Laurent. And then you go and discover that many of his haute couture was inspired by the clothes and the shades, the colors that he saw among the Tuaregs. So it's a very interesting visit to the Yves Saint Laurent uh, Museum in uh, Marrakesh. And this is the tomb where he is buried in the garden, uh, as I mentioned, across the street. Also here we have some fabulous riads for people who like to stay at, but I'd like to take you to the most famous dwelling place. That is the Mamunia Hotel. It's a category by itself. The rooms, the traditional rooms are designed in different uh, shades and colors and furniture. And they are named after uh, some of the people who used to come repeatedly here. Imagine, we mentioned Winston Churchill. Imagine that busy person would come for a couple weeks every year and spend time in the room which he liked with the nice view, with the interesting uh, furniture and art items. Even the bathrooms are designed in the unique way featuring the local architecture and art. And the views of course are stunning. And so you can stay either in the Churchill room or some other celebrities rooms. Here we have Churchill doing his painting right here on the balcony of his room in the Hotel Mamunia. I already mentioned the Tajin. So some of them are very ornate. Some of them are very uh, simple but you'll definitely enjoy at least one meal of this uh, style. They uh, put, they arrange the, the vegetables and the items, whether it's fish or chicken or beef or whatever, in a special pattern and they put it into the oven or over very low flame to cook slow cooking. And it is a typical uh, traditional item everybody experiences. I think you might be familiar also with the couscous, which are these puffed uh, grains, uh, which they again layer using a special soup with all kinds of items. Talking about uh, food, that is a unique story. This is a very special tree, the only tree of its kind, which goats climb to eat the fruit which grows on these tree. Sorry for the graphic details, but if you go and pick up the fruit from the tree, not interesting, but you go to where the goats put away after they ate the fruit, they go through whatever the goats leave behind and they pick up these items and they squeeze them and they squeeze and they produce oil. That is a traditional way of producing the argan oil. Argan oil happens to be the most expensive oil in the world. Can you imagine? And it had to go through the stomach and the body of the goat before you could squeeze it. They use it for cosmetics. They use it for uh, health reasons. I know many people who would not start the day before they take a, a, a spoonful of the argan oil. We leave the city and we go through the Atlas Mountains and we go through the Kasbas. Kasbas are these communities 
built out of the mud bricks. Some of them are quite interesting. I mean, the daring architecture, very simple, very humble. They don't have to worry about burning or baking, if you wish, the mud bricks, because it hardly ever rains here. And if it did and something melted, they'll build another one. So that's a very interesting ride to take in the desert at the foothill of the high Atlas Mountains. As you see, the top of the mountains would be covered by snow, but we are in the desert. And also here, we had Jewish communities. Actually, a very large percentage of the Jews who immigrated to Israel originally came from these very, very humble origins, from these mud brick houses. Uh, the wealthier people who came from the big towns and the ones who were lucky to get education and so on, moved mostly to France, some of them to Montreal, and I noticed some of the uh, last names uh, among us people who joined us. I don't know where you join us from, but uh, they moved to North uh, America as well. So I love visiting those uh, mountain communities, the Kasbas, and especially going into whatever is left, very little, unfortunately, is left out of the Jewish uh, towns and the synagogues. Also, the synagogues were very humble, very simple. An interesting experience is to take a trip into the Sahara Desert, either a jeep ride or both a jeep ride and a camel ride on the dunes. And you can end up glamping, glamorous camping. They have these luxurious tents where you spend an overnight in very, very comfortable setting, yet you are in the desert surrounded by the dunes, even though inside you enjoy every modern convenience and facilities. We concluded our trip. I could have taken you for a much longer ride, but we'd like to talk about the current geopolitics, especially uh, before going back to Casablanca and Rabat, please have a look at the neighboring countries. First of all, Algeria which was home to another Jewish community. Algeria has a different story. The Jews there, most of them were considered French citizens and France remained there for a long time. They had to be literally physically kicked out of there by some local militias who went on an uprising. South of Algeria and Morocco, we see the Western Sahara and you see it says disputed. You might have heard about it. This is an area where both Morocco who controls big chunks of it claims ownership. So does Algeria and especially the impoverished country of Mauritania. It's a huge area with very few people, just a little over a quarter million people. But this is a, an area which is very rich in minerals and raw materials, especially the substance which is called rare earth, which as you know now, we are very short of in production for even your car is painted using some of these elements, your TV monitor is using some of these rare metals. So that is a major focal point and a focal point of local tension which takes place in this area of the Western Sahara. So you might be hearing about it in the news because now they are sitting down seriously for discussions how to enjoy and uh, to, I don't want to use the word exploit, but how to harvest and mine and get hold of these uh, beautiful and very interesting raw materials which are uh, present there in abundance. And here we are back at the airport. And I'll stop uh, sharing and I will open if anybody wants to ask a question or make a comment, please go ahead. Okay, friends. Okay, I uh, see a question here. I see a question. May I, Egal, answer a question? I see Melissa. Sure. Uh, Binenman asked a question. Is it significant that the blue and white are on her tomb? Uh, yes, it is, as I mentioned, very typical colors, both their houses and therefore their clothes and their tombs would be using this kind of uh, colors, absolutely. 
I see that Adam Davis is sharing with us that you celebrated the Congressional Mimuna on Sunday. Absolutely, it started Saturday night. And of course, it is uh, something that most of us would go and visit friends and relatives or neighbors even. Uh, that um, uh, we share with them the special festivities of the Mimuna. Right, Yaakov, we, we have Marilyn Jassem uh, raise her hand. Marilyn, please, please go ahead, Marilyn. Yes, please unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and ask the question. Yes, you would need to unmute yourself on the left of the screen, or you can write the question in the chat. This is extremely interesting. Do you do tours if I were to go? Would we be able to get in touch with you? Oh, with pleasure. I'll have uh, the organization send you my email address and I'll mm -hmm. gladly let you know. Drop me a line and I'll add you to the list and I'll gladly let you know. I have a tour coming up May 11th, but I do run uh, at least once a year. I like to go to Morocco. I travel all over, but Morocco is a beautiful, very, very interesting place, it's both great. the locals and especially the Jewish story. Yes. So, uh, where, where else do you um, travel and tour and so on? Oh my goodness, I didn't want this to be a, <laughs> a platform <laughs> That's to okay. That's okay. Go advertise. Ahead. No, but I lead tours from Egypt to uh, Eastern and Western Europe, Southeast Asia, where we do uh, comparative religions mm -hmm. to all over. I've led tours, as you heard, in dozens of countries, and I'd love to have you join me. I, as I mentioned, uh, at least two people that I was able to recognize have traveled with me a couple of times uh, in different locations, and I'd love to uh, have more of you join me on tours because I think uh, tracing and discovering Jewish roots and Jewish heritage. I find it so fascinating, the yeah. different display and the different appearances, if you want, of Jewish culture in different locations. I find mm. it absolutely fascinating. Yes, it is. Thank you so much. Yes, we will, we will gladly we will gladly share uh, Yaakov's uh, contact information if he allowed, obviously he allowed us. So uh, uh, we will sh we will share that. Uh, we you. do have we have one more hand. Uh, Elise Zimmerman, please uh, un unmute yourself and go ahead and ask the question. Yes, hi, Yakov. Hi, hi. I hi, I wanted to know how you felt that Jews are received in Morocco. I just wondered because when when I traveled there, it felt uncomfortable for me because I didn't realize that you had to cover your shoulders, you're not supposed to wear shorts. I, I was unaware that the, um, you know, the Islamic uh, customs were going to really affect me as a tourist. And I, and I just wanted to know whether or not there was a bias against women, Americans, and Jews. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to start with the last part, with your permission. We feel so welcome there. Wherever you go, oh, Jews, oh, my grandfather used to tell me about the good old days when we had the Jewish neighbors and friends and we miss them so much. Now we are from Israel or we are Jews in general. Oh, we admire Israel. We think the greatest items come from there and your technology and your discovery and your medical care and so on and so on. Uh, when it comes to women and Westerns, yes, you are right. It's a very traditional society. Women are, as you said, subjected to wear in a different way and cover themselves. I'm sorry they didn't let you know that before, because if you know it, then it's okay, you know? So you know that you can go to the beach and you wear your bikinis and feel absolutely comfortable. But if you go to visit their towns, and especially if you go to a mosque or a mausoleum or a madrasa and so on, uh, you will have to cover yourself. But no, not only do I feel comfortable, I know there are a few people here who visited and uh, we can ask Kate or somebody to share their experiences with us because I and everybody I ever traveled with, uh, always felt very, very comfortable and welcome. 
welcome in Morocco, absolutely. I see that my address was added to the chat, so thank you so much and you are all welcome to uh, write to me and I'll gladly answer your uh, questions and I'll add you to my uh, list, which I sent out when I uh, put together a trip. We didn't travel much, as you can imagine, the last couple of years. I see here, Linda says, not for one minute did I feel uncomfortable and I thank you for it. And I happen to absolutely agree. I'm so sorry, Elise, that you, you felt that way, but otherwise really, yeah. Uh, friends, uh, right now I put on chat, uh, with the permission of Yaakov, his uh, email. Yes, we have it. Yes, ah, yeah? we have it. Yeah, yeah, Shoshan we have it. At gmail.com, yeah. so yeah, yeah. you can contact him directly. We have a question from uh, Natella. Natella, go ahead. Please unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Yes, hi. I, I've been to Morocco and absolutely loved it. Felt very safe, very, very safe and very like welcomed. I don't know <laughs> why someone would say uh, the country is not uh, as uh, friendly, um, but um, I'm interested in the tour on May 11th, you were saying, or when is it upcoming? Like you, I, I'm sorry, I missed the date. May 11th, but unfortunately, this is a it's tour cool. I cannot invite you to because this is a, a party traveling together, gotcha. like, a okay. like a private tour, but I will let you know of uh, upcoming tours, which will be open, of course, for people to join us. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely, would love to, and um, please do share your info and the list and information and whatever you have to share. I hope I'll get all the info. <laughs> and the re how do I access the recording? Because I joined. Um, so everyone, so everyone who registered uh, for this presentation will be able to receive a link in the email. Also, uh -huh. please, also please, friends, sign up. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. Kajeko YouTube channel. So all the public lectures and presentations are shared there. Uh, and uh, you just write the name of the organization, C-O-J-E-C-O, -E Kojeko, uh, okay. stands for Council of Jewish Emigrant Community Organizations and all of our public lectures are shared there. Uh, oh. but, but but you, you know, today or tomorrow when the recording is ready, we will share it in the email as well. So. Uh, Super, be a love that. And all and, all other presentations you are able to find there. Right, uh, and I would like to uh, to to remind you that uh, these uh, presentations they are uh, for free for our participants, and they depends on your donation. And uh, we put here our link. And please don't forget to make your donation. That will allow yes. us. Uh, some of you, continue. some of you are quite good at multitasking, so. We received a few donations right during the presentation. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, every dollar counts and it enables us to continue wonderful programs on Jewish culture and traditions and traveling around the world. Uh, so thank you to all who donated. Uh, Yaakov, we do have a question about the history of uh, Jews of Morocco. Where do they come from? You know, are they are they Sephardic? Are they, you know, Middle Eastern? How do they see themselves? Where, what is the history? Yes, I see that uh, somebody already was kind enough and put here <laughs> the history of uh, brief, very brief history of the Jews. Uh, and you see, I think it was uh, Adam Davis who wrote that their history is 2000 years old and absolutely right. They did come from ancient Israel Mostly they came with the waves of the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians are the ones who settled North Africa and subsequently Spain and Sicily and different locations in Italy and the Jews joined them. The Phoenicians were both merchants and sailors and the Jews came trading and facilitated in negotiating and whatever. And that was the original population. Another very large wave really came after the deportation, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain after the edict of expulsion that was issued, as you know, in 1492 by the Catholic kings Isabella and Ferdinand. So that's why you will find names like Toledano and Cordovez and so on among many of the Moroccan Jews. <clears throat> and then uh, they left and came back and left and came back. And now quite a lot of people, actually hundreds of them, 
maintain like a summer residence, like habitation secondaire, like a vacation homes, <clears throat> excuse me, they live in uh, France or elsewhere, but they come to Morocco to spend some uh, time there. Uh, I was asked about the Jews of Safi. Actually, I know the Turjeman family from Safi. They live in, uh, in uh, who live in, in Israel and some of them live actually in Manhattan, not far from your office. There is a family, Turjeman family who comes from Safi. Um, they were very, very humble uh, Jews who insisted on sending their kids to get education, probably from Safi, uh, probably more than many other communities in Morocco. Lots of them were able to get higher education and different from the Jews who came from the Kasbas, where unfortunately many of them didn't have access to higher education. So that's what we talk about when we mentioned the Jews from Safi, we mentioned how important education was to them. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, we have a question about, uh, uh, I know many American-based Jewish Moroccans who have done DNA tests with results showing Southern uh, Italy, but none of us can trace our lineage there. Have you heard anything like this before? No, I'm afraid I haven't heard it. That's very interesting. I haven't heard it. And uh, and somebody is writing, my family still has their home on Rue de Bordeaux in Rabat, probably not for very much longer. Oh. My goodness, yes, I can see the name, Arie. Yes, uh, it was a beautiful community, but as you said yourself, there is not going to be, I'm afraid, real future for a Jewish community there. So they'll come for holiday, they'll come to reminiscence, but I don't see a resurgence of uh, Jewish communities. I can tell you <clears throat> that there is going to be very big commercial activity. There is going to be very, very... Yes, Friends, friends, please. The background. background noise. The relations between Israel and Morocco, other than the diplomatic relations, are based on lots and lots of economy, not only trading with goods, but Israeli technology, Israeli medical equipment, Israeli telecommunication, and so on and so on. So now there is very big activity. The airplanes fly almost daily uh, between Israel and Morocco. Both El Al and the local uh, companies uh, used to be Israel and Arkia, the Israeli companies. Now it's even the Royal Air Maroc, uh, which flies uh, uh, to Israel. And lots of business people and lots of sales people exchange in agriculture. Uh, it's funny because we used to compete with them over the fruits and vegetable markets in Europe, especially the citrus, you know, the famous Jaffa orange for many years. And then we had big competition from beautiful oranges, which were grown in, uh, in, uh, in Morocco. They filled up the markets in uh, uh, Europe. Somebody asked, what is the best time to visit? Now, if you go for holiday, then you can't find nicer seaside resorts like in places like uh, Agadir uh, on the shores of the, of the Atlantic Ocean. But if you wanna do the sightseeing we mentioned, I suggest try to avoid July and August. The best really ideally is to travel between October and the end of May. July and August can be pretty hot inside in the country, in the Sahara Desert, in, in the inner part of the land, away from the ocean and away from the Mediterranean. But as I said, for various reasons, different times of the year will be perfectly comfortable. Thank you, friends. Any more questions? Yeah, Mar Marilyn, please uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. Un Yeah, you are still muted. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Um, can you put up your email again, address? It was too quick. Yeah, yeah, it's it's in the chat. Emily, it's in the chat. Shoshan at gmail.com. 
Thank okay, I'll, I'll 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 post it again. I'll post it. Again. Yeah. Uh, right here in the in the chat. Ah, yeah, so stunned. Thank you. Thank you. Like a ro a rose, right? <laughs> Beautiful <laughs> rose. It's a dispute. It's a rose or a lily? Maybe it's a two. Version. Actually, or it's a lily. lily, right? Or a lily, lily in biblical Hebrew. That's yeah. right. All right, Asa, Asa and Ben Slim, please go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe I miss it. Uh, why all uh, Moroccan Jews uh, almost uh, went to Israel? What had happened historically? The state of Israel was founded and it was home for the Jews. After the foundation of the state of Israel, there were some events with some riots and uh, some um, uh, even uh, pogroms, if pogroms. you want, right. small scale pogroms, like it happened in all of the other Arab countries. And they felt that it's gonna be much safer to go to Israel. Until the 1950s, France was ruling the area. So under the auspices of France, after the war, they felt kind of secure. And then when Morocco got its independence, the king has returned from exile. He was in exile in Africa. But the state of Israel was building up and opening its doors to all Jews from all over the world. And they came in the masses. And they are the ones who were uh, really building the country in the 50s and the 60s. They were not the original pioneers who built the country. The most of them who came from the former uh, Tsar empire, the Russian empire, and subsequently uh, from uh, Soviet Union and from many other countries, of course, around the world. But to really build the country, what we call the development towns in the Negev, in the Galilee, and to serve in the army and to fight our horrible wars and so on. So they were like a very major, major part of the effort of building up Israel from Morocco, from Algeria, from Tunisia, from Libya, from these North African countries. So it's still uh, more uh, Russians right now than Moroccans, as I understand. In Israel, yes, <laughs> especially the last 30 years. <laughs> especially the last 30 years when we got one over one. One big happy family. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. But you know what? Uh, if you talk today, to you walk around in Israel and you talk to people, young people, teenagers, and you say, where are your, where are your family from? He wouldn't really understand what you talk about. Right. When I was growing up, you were either Sephardi or Ashkenazi with very few people who said, oh, I'm a mixed marriage, you know, that was like a shande sometimes even to some families. But now young people marry each other and you're going to have a quarter Moroccan, a quarter Ukrainian, another quarter from Chile and then somebody from India or from Ethiopia from all over. So I think maybe in one more generation, it won't really be an issue. You'll only tell about your family past. Thank you very much. It was very, very much interesting about the trip to Morocco. It's beautiful, absolutely. Thank you. And you, you, you uh, get us beautiful presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, friends. Uh, we hate to interrupt the the presentations with our solicitations but uh, if you are enjoying the presentation if you have enjoyed this presentation please consider supporting us there is a link in the chat on how you can donate to Kajeko so we uh, so we can continue our programs and uh, if there are no more questions let's let's check the chat no okay so lots of thank yous yes we join uh, everyone in the audience in thanking uh, Yaakov, uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, we will keep in touch. And this was uh, absolutely wonderful. Uh, friends, please.